Spectrum is brought to you by the Scripps College of Communication at Ohio University. The Scripps College offers the foundation for individuals seeking to blend creativity and practice so that graduates have the freedom to direct their skills and move the world forward. Its faculty takes a multidisciplinary approach to academic, professional, and social growth so that graduates have relentless optimism to navigate the changing environment. Learn more at ohio.edu slash Scripps College. Welcome to Spectrum. Spectrum features conversations with fascinating people. Some are famous and some aren't, but the common thread is that they all have captivating stories. Today we talk with our frequent guest, Philip Elliott, Washington correspondent for Time. He also is the author of Time's weekday newsletter, DC Brief. Phil talks with us about the current state of the Republican Party and the continuing political influence of former President Donald Trump. You and I talked right after the inauguration about what would happen to the Republican Party, uh, and we're going to really dig deep into this, but give me a synopsis of what's happened since you and I last talked. Since the inauguration to today, what's happened to the Republican Party? There was a brief moment of flirtation among Republicans of putting Donald Trump in the rearview mirror that they had considered after the inauguration of President Joe Biden, hey, Donald Trump is gone. This is an opportunity for Republicans to reboot. They they flirted with that. They failed at that. That is the top line there. That any consideration they had for putting Trump in the gutter um, went by the wayside. Polls have consistently shown among Republicans, Donald Trump remains a unifying figure, a popular figure, and a powerful figure. Donald Trump is the animating factor in the Republican Party at this point. Given that reality, many, many Republican leaders have been reluctant to put him out to pasture. This is uh, an aging figure, and his um, the potential for him to continue impacting Republican politics, just from a statistical perspective, is finite. Um, The the actuarial tables do not show him as a long, um, a long term bet for this world. He's seventy seventy four and has some uh, morbidity issues with obesity and other things. Correct. He's also still younger than Joe Biden, who is the president. Um, to be fair, but they are counting on Donald Trump to being on on Trump being a powerful and defining figure for the Republican Party for at least um, the next few years to hear a lot of strategists tell it. He's got a 30-year shelf, shelf, shelf life on him. They are afraid of crossing him, and they are doing everything they can to hew their messaging to Donald Trump is the leader of the Republican Party. There have been a number of times when Given the opportunity, top Republicans have declined to criticize Trump and have actually been spending a lot of time down in Florida trying to curry his favor, which is an interesting tactic um, considering it's not entirely clear that given the given the opportunity that Donald Trump will actually lift a finger to help any of these Republicans in the midterm elections when Donald Trump's name is not on the ballot. There's also an undercurrent of whether Trump runs for president again in 2024, whether he throws his weight behind someone, whether he makes his life's mission to destroy some individuals, which we've seen terribly effective when he 
sets his mind to it, or whether he raise, helps them raise money. And to that final point, what percentage of the take does he put in his own pockets? That there's a lot of money to be made threatening to run for president. There's a lot of money to be made when you run for president. And what? how much of that goes to his loyalists, his allies, his vendors um, in, in this, what is essentially, I mean, the political industrial complex, which is a billion dollar industry at its smallest and a trillion dollar industry when you take it in its aggregate. I, I get this mental image, Phil, of, of people going to Mar-a-Lago, uh, similar to The Godfather, where they're going to ask for favors and not knowing whether they're deserving of those favors. No, it's entirely accurate. And there's, there's you know, Francis Ford Coppola version of this is happening in a gilded room in a mansion Built, built built by a serial heiress um, in, in West Palm Beach. I mean, it is a ridiculous situation, but it is where we are, that there is, you know, the top Republican in the House, Kevin McCarthy, was down there posing for pictures and pretending he had had no criticism for Donald Trump in the immediate wake of the insurrection on January 6th. One note worth flagging, though, is that not all Republicans are doing this that there are the likes of Liz Cheney, who was booted from her leadership post because she was not going to go kiss the ring, uh, to keep extrapolating on this godfather analogy. And then there are those like Mitch McConnell, who privately is seething about Donald Trump, never really liked the guy, didn't trust him, found him an unreliable partner, but a useful tool in McConnell's agenda. McConnell has not been to West Palm Beach. He has not spoken to the president since no, since January 6th, actually, and has very little interest in returning to that moment, uh, returning to the point where Donald Trump was the apex predator of the Republican Party. But McConnell realizes his path back to having a, the gavel in the Senate um, may rely on Donald Trump's popularity. The Senate right now is a 50-50 chamber, right. and Vice President Kamala Harris is breaking all of the ties. Um, there is a scenario in which M Mitch McConnell gets to become the majority leader another, t another time in 2022, after the 2022 elections, actually in 2023, um, when Republicans if Republicans can leverage Donald Trump's popularity among the party base. And that is where the, there's a lot of just craven political calculation going on here. But but let me ask, to, to sort of get this straight in my mind, you know, yes, Republicans picked up seats in the House in this past election, in the 2020 election, but they lost the, the Senate. Uh you know, most of the analysts that I read say that they lost the suburban vote, they lost the um, the college educated vote, they lost votes that they had gotten earlier, or traditionally go Republican. Are they writing off those people? How are they going to get them back? embracing the person who turned those people off in the first place. The electorate in 2020 and the electorate in 2022 are going to be very different. The midterm electorate is always, um, there's always a drop off in intensity and in participation. That it's one thing when you're consistently bombarded with news of a presidential election your local congressman is not going to command that same attention. Even in Senate races that are top flight, we're talking, you know, we're, we're talking a hundred million bucks. That's kind of the baseline for a competitive Senate race mm -hmm. we're for advertising. In a presidential race, we're talking a billion dollars. So, I mean, it's, it's just a, it's an order of magnitude difference. Also, there is the belief among some, I'm not sure how valid it is, that 
there will be um, a shift in demographics that are happening. And at the House level, gerrymandering will be so much more intense that in districts that have been drawn for Republicans by Republican state legislatures, because Republicans do control state legislatures far in far greater numbers than Democrats, and they control the battle. The, they, they, they can define the battlegrounds. Um, they draw the battle lines of what districts are competitive. And in districts that have been drawn to favor Republicans, um, standing with the president, standing with former President Trump, will be seen as the litmus test in primaries. And that is where um, the electeds actually will be decided. And it, for people out there who may not be uh, up on, on politics, after each census every 10 years, uh, the House seats uh, are reallocated based upon population and state legislative bodies have the right to choose the districts from which those Congress people run. Uh, obviously, they always uh, keep incumbents safe and they try to uh, deep six as many Democrats as possible, and they try to have any marginal districts tip Republican. Would that be an accurate characterization? More or less. I mean, it is. There are some states like Ohio where they have taken steps to try to take politics out of this, but there's always a way to put your thumb on the scale, and it happens a lot. And in states, I mean, you're sitting in Ohio. Um, you're losing a you're losing a yeah. member of Congress. I mean, people are leaving the state of Ohio. They're moving to states, um, generally <laughs> Sun Belt states. Um, I mean, Ohio is going to lose a member of Congress, and it's going to be interesting to see where the it was 2018 when the when the uh, voters decided they wanted to take the politics out of this. But there's still a way to you know, carve out here and there. I mean, the, some of these districts in Ohio, um, as they stand today, d are frankly ridiculous. Um, they, they they look like a, uh, you know, a jigsaw puzzle more than any contiguous. Um, in, in Ohio, I mean, there is a, um, as it stands now, only I believe it is um, a handful of congressional districts can, you know, subdivide county borders but you know they're going to use their their few carve outs to do some really creative, to put it nicely, um, carve outs to to figure out how to keep certain demographics in certain places. I'm thinking the Cleveland district that for years was majority minority, just basically saying all black people in Cleveland get to have one member of Congress, and yeah. it is going to be this person. And this is going to be the black congressional district. Everyone else gets to elect a Republican. So let's get back to Washington mm -hmm. and let's get back to two. Well, before I get there, I want, I want to ask this question, Matt Gates, Matt Gates being under investigation uh, for all types of act activities, sexual and otherwise, uh, his partner in crime, uh, indicted people think he's going to flip on Matt Gates and, and, uh, that's going to be a, an ugly scene. Um, now we've learned over the last week that the New York state attorney general and the New York city, uh, uh, uh district attorney are, are looking at criminal charges potentially against the Trump organization and what all that means in uh, individuals uh, we don't know yet. All of these scandals slash controversies slash criminal activity, if I'm a Republican sitting on the sideline should I embrace the person who's at the center of that, Donald Trump, or should I back off? A couple things here, and I'm going to take them separately because the Matt Gates situation 
while Matt Gates is a strong supporter of Donald Trump, the things that he is in that he is in potential trouble for have nothing to do with the president. So Correct. I, I Correct. just want to be fair in no, that. No, you're you're absolutely right. So Matt Gates potentially is involved in a sex trafficking um, scandal with a local elected official who has agreed to cooperate with prosecutors. That is potentially devastating. That said, this is a district that is deep, deep red and is not going to, um, Democrats don't, shouldn't even bother fielding a candidate there, uh, frankly. That, that is, that is a, a district where the national political mood has nothing to do with it. Also, Matt Gates has always been something of a political gadfly. This is a man who wore a gas mask to work when to mock and troll um, those of us who are wearing cloth face coverings at the Capitol. Um, the, the district knows Matt Gates and puts up with Matt Gates. Also, it's Florida, which has its own unique and weird brand of politics. So I'm not sure that this this cloud of scandal over him is as disqualifying in Florida as it would be in Ohio. As for Trump and his legal woes, I think there is a there are a couple problems lurking for him. There's, you know, the New York City prosecutors who are looking at this. There's the Federal Southern District of New York looking at this. And then there's the New York Attorney General who campaigned on a vow of rooting out Trump's um, potential corruption. All three of these are cooperating at this moment, which is not a good sign if you're President Donald Trump. Right. You've also got the president's former, the, the CFO of the president's com- of the former president's company is at the center. His former um in-laws are cooperating. There's just a lot going on here. And for rank and file voters, there is a very compelling message that the president's, the former president's team is putting together. And that is, this is a witch hunt. This has been something they've been hearing for four years um, in various incarnations. And the president's team is just saying, playing the victim card here. And it has just been so pervasive, especially in conservative media, that, you know, they couldn't beat him on impeachment twice. So now they're trying to get him in the law. And that Donald Q. Trump, as private citizen, is still being subjected to big government's overreach. And that's a message that may resonate quite well with conservatives who are deeply it, distrustful of the government. It'll it'll resonate with his base, but will it resonate with that group that may not say that we're part of that base, but still Republican? Right, but the primaries in 2022 are going to be decided by the president's base. That the Republican Party's base is to a tune of 80% or more still loyal to this president. And that is, those are the people who show up and are and decide who the who the nominees will be in House districts. So if you're looking to take back the House, you can't do it with a at least to, at least to my mind at this moment, barring some major development, you can't retake the House if you're Kevin McCarthy with Liz Cheney branded Republicans. You've got to do it with Donald Trump branded Republicans, and that's why they're all falling over each other to get the president's endorsement. And that means unflinching and, so, and often blind loyalty to the president and his, and his message of the big steal. Doesn't, doesn't that though, and I know reapportionment factors in here and voter suppression factors in here, but doesn't make it make those sort of nut job uh, candidates uh, targets for Democrats? Easier targets for Democrats. Yeah, but Marjorie Taylor Greene comes from a district that is just hugely, it is deeply red. You're, you're not going to be able to pick off um, 
you know, that seat in Georgia with the QAnon theorist um, in, you know, roaming the halls of Congress. It's just, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, you'd, you'd be further ahead to look at, you know, some of the marginal districts. Um, I'm thinking Steve Chabot's seat in Ohio, for one, um, down in the Cincinnati area would be a better target than the, the you know, the Madison Cawthorns or the Marjorie Taylor Greens, um, the Paul Gosars, you know, the people who get all the attention on the right for their um, embrace of conspiracy theories. That is where the battle for the, major- the, the battle for the gavel um, in 2022 is going to be fought in those districts, not in districts with, as you as you call them, the nut jobs. The nut jobs come from places where voters know what they believe and they're good with it. So let's talk about Mitch McConnell uh, a, a bit. Um, and let me preface this by polls that I read say that people are upset with Congress, both parties, because it is gridlock. It does nothing. Uh, McConnell, as you pointed out, not a big fan of Trump, uh, doesn't talk with him, certainly doesn't embrace him, but comes out with a statement saying that my primary role, and I'm paraphrasing, my primary role is to stop the passage of the Biden agenda. That's, That's my singular focus. Now, how does that play with the polls out there that say people are upset with that kind of attitude? So there's a, it's not that dis, not that far in the rearview mirror um, historical antecedent to this is this was McConnell's plan during the Obama era. And it worked. McConnell was able to win the majority using this playbook. Um, the 2010 midterms, were hugely successful for Republicans, both in the House and the Senate. And gridlock, everyone was upset with gridlock in Washington in 2009, 2010. They didn't love Obamacare in the same way. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, it's really easy to do an overlay here of, okay, Obama was trying to do a stimulus package. Biden's trying to do stimulus package. Obama did... Um, really big Obamacare ideas um, for to help families. Biden's trying to do this family infrastructure plan. And the, the acrimony around it poisoned everything. But voters, at least back then, didn't blame McConnell for the problem. They blamed Obama for the problem. They, th- they saw a partisan president in the White House pushing an agenda that not everyone really understood. They liked parts of it, but they didn't like it in its branding. And they ended up punishing Democrats and, you know, t- gave the gavel uh, at that point to John Boehner. They may give the gavel to Kevin McCarthy or Steve Scalise or Elise Stefanik or whoever um, emerges from the Hunger Games of the Republican Party and figures out, and, and who can figure out how to brand the Republican Party. So, yes, voters are frustrated with the gridlock. They don't attribute it to Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell's not in charge of Washington. And that's that's the joy of being the, the guy on the outside um, throwing bombs in, that ultimately voters take a look. They, they don't like the gridlock, and they say, who's in charge? And they punish the person in charge, even though the person in charge really doesn't have control of the situation. Also, there's an intensity question. I mean, it's everyone likes this, everyone dislikes that, but what are they actually voting on? And it has nothing to do with that. Gridlock in Washington, that's like florals in spring. It's not shocking. So if you're Biden, What do you do with this? Do you keep proposing legislation, Voting Rights Act, infrastructure bills, you know, getting them passed through the House, letting them be killed by Republicans in the Senate, and then argue that, hey, things would have been better but for? 
Yeah, and that is the question Biden's team is facing here. You know, I've had a number of, um, I should let's put let's say they're testy conversations um, with top Biden officials uh, throughout his cabinet, and there is a there are two ways they they are trying to run this. One is Joe Biden, you know, served in the Senate for thirty six years. He served eight years as Joe, um, Barack Obama's vice president. He has been in national politics since 1972. Joe Biden thinks himself of thinks of himself as a person who can get the big deals done, work across the aisle, is buddy buddy, and can you know at the you know he can strike the deal. He can go into the Senate steam room and figure out how to you know get to yes. And everything that this bipartisan Biden is proposing has resonance among Republicans. They don't want their bridges collapsing. They think child care is too expensive, and they'd like it. They frankly, they'd like a tax cut. On the other side are the progressives, who weren't dying to have Joe Biden as the nominee in twenty twenty, right, right. but Joe Biden emerged as the chief alternative to Donald Trump, that he was the guy who had an electability factor that was off the charts, and it turns out he won. Progressives have been grumbling for a long while, but never complaining that Joe Biden just doesn't understand the American political system as it stands today. They have been holding fire, by and large, because... They want Joe Biden to succeed. They also don't really love his his pursuit of bipartisan solutions. You're starting to see you're starting to see some of that patience chip away. You're starting to see it crack. It's it's like the the, the clay that was really pl- useful in 2020 in putting together you know, the avatar of Joe Biden, it's Mm -hmm. starting to dry out. It's starting to flake off and it's starting to uh, just start making a whole lot of dust in progressive waiting rooms. They're running out of patience with Joe Biden and you're starting to see some warning shots be fired. They're, they're not explicitly breaking with him, but you can see, you can see the frustration growing and it's, it's not without merit. I mean, you see immigration groups um, starting to realize that the crisis on the southern border is, it's, it's not abating. You're seeing um, education unions, NEA, AFT, they, they are giving Biden, okay, like we're going to be in person in the fall pretty much in this country, but you didn't get us the money we needed as educators to feel safe in our classrooms. You didn't pay us, you know, combat wages to come back. Um, you didn't do anything for the year of, you know, Zoom University. What, what, we, we, where are you on this? You're, you're seeing um, public employees unions um, who wanted, who, who stood to benefit greatly from this infrastructure push um, spent spread over eight years of um, upgrades that they're they're seeing, you know, infrastructure shrink and shrink and shrink, if not shrivel and nothing to show for it. And and you're seeing just, you know, you know, the liberal pipe dreams of, you know, free community college, universal pre-K these big ticket, ambitious, and actually rooted in good policy ideas um, come up short. And we're, we're now past the 100-day mark of the president's for first term, perhaps his only term. And really, nothing really major to show for it. You, you had a, a, a stimulus um, pandemic relief bill, but... That was responding to events, not shaping them. And that is where you're going to see a lot of angst among liberals. And that actually spells depressed turnout for the 2022 midterms among the progressives who showed up 
um, in 2020 for for Biden when they really were they were pining pining for Bernie, Bernie Sanders, but they were like we can't have Donald Trump another term. Well, Trump's not on the ballot, um, but Joe Biden's perhaps milk toast first term agenda is. And that's, that's, that's an intensity question the Democrats are going to have to contend with. We'll be back after this message. Spectrum's brought to you by the Scripps College of Communication at Ohio University. The Scripps College is one of the most comprehensive colleges of communication in the country. It offers a foundation of creativity and practice so that graduates can move the world forward. In particular, the Scripps College offers challenging coursework that holds students to high expectations and integrated curriculum that combines a variety of disciplines and ideas and student-driven media organizations where students can apply these skills and gain experience that enables them to hit the ground running upon graduation. That's the Scripps College of Communication at Ohio University. All right, so let me take this and focus it right on Joe Manchin from West Virginia, the senator from West Mm -hmm. Virginia. The filibuster rule in the Senate says uh, you have to have what? Is it 60 percent or two thirds? It always escapes me. It's well, it's it depends on how the rules package for that particular uh, Congress is set up because every Congress adopts it. But in, in practice, it's 60 votes. All right, so 60 votes out of the, the, the 100 to get legislation beyond a filibuster and to be voted on. As you mentioned, Democrats uh, break the tie to have the majority because of Kamala Harris being the vice president who sits as president of the Senate. So Manchin has said, uh, and he's been the target I will never vote to get rid of the filibuster. It it just won't happen. Uh, But yet, I would think that some people in the Biden camp are saying, you know, we have to get legislative successes. We have to get something that the people feel. We have to give something that's good Good morning in America, like Ronald Reagan. We have to make people feel good about their government. And to do that, we've got to get legislation passed, and it won't be passed if we keep the filibuster rule. How do you respond to that? So there are people in the Biden camp who are saying that, but the only person who actually matters is Joe Biden himself. And Joe Biden is a creature of the Senate. Joe Biden spent 36 years representing the state of Delaware. He is very aware of the role of minority power here. I mean, Delaware is a very, very tiny state, but it has equal standing with California. Delaware has two senators. California has two senators. It's... the. Joe Biden respects the way that the Senate puts everyone on e- every state on equal footing. Joe Biden also has seen the power of a minority party to stop legislation. Joe Biden is not going to move quickly to change that dynamic. The House is built on a system of bigger states have bigger voices. The Senate's built on every state is the same. That's not really going to change. The same, you can extrapolate that to the political party system, that if, you know, the passions of the House can be stopped in the Senate. And that's where Joe Biden is of a mind that the Senate should be a place where things don't squeak by, things don't go on a strictly partisan vote, that there has to be a bipartisan buy-in to set a national agenda. It's not a party agenda, it's a national agenda. And that's that's why Joe Biden has been very reluctant to start down the road of changing um, filibuster rules. That said, 
The filibuster is not in the Constitution. This is strictly a creation of the Senate, and right. the Senate could destroy it if it so felt needed. Joe Manchin <clears throat> is a complicated figure and someone I've spent a, a decent amount of time with in having these conversations. And part of it is philosophical that the Senate shouldn't be a partisan body and the Senate shouldn't embrace a partisan agenda and the Senate this and that. On a practical level, Joe Manchin may be the last Democrat who can be elected statewide in the state of West Virginia, at least in our lifetime. I mean, West Virginia is the second most Trump positive state in 2020. <laughs> it is a place of very conservative politics. I mean, even even when Bill Clinton carried West Virginia, it was a state where Bill Clinton went in there with a Southern accent and with the good old boy routine going strong and doing everything he could to really nurse a lot of grievances and paranoia and economic depression. There, That state is not ripe for someone like Kamala Harris to go in there and try to make the case. Right. Joe Manchin is fighting for his political life, but he knows how to thread the needle and he's really smart at how he can do this. Joe Manchin, if he, if he were to give Chuck Schumer <clears throat> the gavel unilaterally and say, we're going to do this with Kamala Harris breaking ties, Joe Manchin will not be going back to the Senate. And that Senate seat will forever be in Republican hands, or at least for a generation. So there's a practical consideration here of, do you live with Joe Manchin, who's reliable when he absolutely has to be for Democrats, or do you give it to um, Governor Justice and just say, hey, here's a far right vote on everything, and he is partnering with, he, he, I mean, it's... Politics is a, is what is the art of the possible. <laughs> Joe Manchin gives Democrats a chance at, you know, renewing the Americans with Disabilities Act and maybe some voting rights um, renewal, uh, renewing the Voting Rights Act. Or do you go with someone who's going to be introducing bathroom bills till um, to the high holy days? Okay, so. Let's circle back to the Republicans now. And, you know, we've had this bill to set up the January 6th commission to do an in-depth investigation past the House with some, few, but some Republican votes. Gets to the Senate, it will go nowhere. Um how do the Democrats play that? Is that an Achilles heel for the Republicans or not? There are two th schools of thought here in Washington. And I've been <clears throat> reporting on this for a couple of weeks now. And there is, <clears throat> the, let, let's take the two arguments separately. Democrats believe Republicans will pay the price for this because they're trying to cover up their complicity in a mob that came to try to kill them. Democrats think that this just lays bare the Republican complicity with Donald Trump to try to overturn the election, negate truth, and deny the election results. Republicans, however, by a staggering majority, believe the big lie. They believe that Donald Trump was is the duly elected president of the United States, that rhinos, Republicans in name only, um, at the Capitol on January 6th did not stand up for the duly elected president of the United States, in their mind, Donald Trump, and went along with Democrats, quote, big steal of the election. You're looking at a question of whether the Republican Party wants to stand with the reality that, you know, Joe Biden didn't run a perfect campaign, but it was good enough to be Donald Trump where he needed to, or that Donald Trump 
had the election taken out from under him. Donald Trump remains the animating force in the Republican Party. Donald Trump has convinced enough Republicans, the overwhelming majority to be clear, that he is, in fact, the President of the United States, and that the election was stolen from him. I mean, it's telling that Donald Trump, down at Mar-a-Lago, has never referred to himself as the former president. Every press release that comes out of Mar-a-Lago refers to him as the president, as though he is still the president of the United States to this day. And it's, I mean, they, it's never former president, it's the 45th president, as though he is the last president of the United States, uh, the most recent president, and the current president. It's a curious bit of branding, but it is um, in keeping with how we've seen other um, deposed leaders continue referring to themselves. I'm saying, I mean, like here in here in Washington, you you in recent years you often seen like the Empress Farah of Iran uh, refer be referred to as such, not the you know the wife of the deposed leader, the, the wife right. of the deposed Shah. All right. So if if that's going to go nowhere with no repercussions, um, let's talk a little bit. And I'm going to use this as a transition ultimately to Liz Cheney, but I want to concentrate just on this for a moment. You're a journalist. You've been a journalist all your professional career. You work in a world of facts documentation, uh, support of those facts to make sure that they're accurate. Does this frighten you at all that we're in this world of big lies and big steals and we're gravitating away from a truth-based or a fact-based politic? Yeah, and it, it it should. I mean, I am frightened every day that we can live in a world where unsubstantiated claims are treated on the same plane as, you know, documented things that I've seen with my own eyes. It is terrifying to think, it, it is sometimes terrifying to have conversations with political professionals who admit they know better, but know that they cannot win in this environment if they only stick with the facts, that they have to coddle what they know to be non-truths in order to get through the door and win. We're seeing a lot of this in some of these governor's races that are shaping up. We're seeing, we're going to see this in down ballot races. Um, for you know, for instance, the Georgia Secretary of State's race is going to be a proxy um, campaign for this. What his um, the Secretary of State there who refused Trump's plea to just find new votes, find them, find them under the table. I don't care where right. you find them, just just find them, find them. Give me the votes, give me the win. It'll be good. I'll have your back. And the Secretary of State followed the law. I mean, no one will accuse um, Brad of being a a, a, you know, secret Democrat that, I mean, he's a pretty conservative dude, but he also knows how to read the law. Um, so we're now seeing a lot of this going to be playing out over the next 18 months as we head into the midterms, probably about the next year as we go through the primaries. And either you embrace the big lie or you face a primary challenger. And you know, especially in house districts that we don't yet know where their borders are, this could be a pretty terrifying experience. Um, you're, you're seeing a lot of this as an animating factor for why we're seeing House members announce at a very, well, not a rapid, but faster than normal pace, announce that they're just not coming back. They're either going to find a new gig or they're going to retire or they're just, they're just done. Like, they're, they'll find a second act in politics. I mean, the, the 
the choice for a lot of these, especially Republicans, is do you say Donald Trump actually won the election, or do you say other say do you embrace fact? On a personal level, it's it's just maddening to have conversations with political operatives whom I still respect because you know I don't agree with their conclusions, but their analysis isn't wrong. That they have to stick with the president, or else their careers are over. That you know there there is no honor among thieves, and this has to be where they land in order to continue in their profession. Um, they, they, for a lot of them, they have no other skills. So this is all they have available right. to them. Um, <laughs> right. It is, you know, it, it's a combination of marketing and um, marketing, communication, pandering, whatever you want to call right. it. Right. This, is, this is what they do. This is how they make their careers. And for many of them, this is a very lucrative way to make a living. Um, and they can either go full tilt Trump or they can go never Trump. And some of the never Trumpers have made, um, very nice pay, have, have enjoyed very nice paydays, but their Twitter timelines are absolute garbage in the amount of hatred sent at them. Like I, even at the height of the Iraq war, no one very few people were sending such animus to people like, you know, Ari Fleischer or Dana Perino. Like right. they didn't like them, but you know, you'd have the errant nut job with the death threat. Now death threats are just kind of like badge of honor. Like, Hey, how many people, how many never Trumpers did you threaten to off today on the QAnon boards? And that's just like, that that's kind of, that's kind of, that's a metric by which these people pride themselves. It, it's absolutely insane. So let me ask you a sub question, and then I want do want to end up with with Liz Cheney. The sub question is: Do you feel media is cons- complicit in this? You know why is why is this? lie and fabrication still getting legs in the news? Um, Part of it is, I mean, we can't ignore, this is a divided country. It's still probably a center-right country, if, if all the analysis and polling is right. And a majority, a vast majority, of the larger political party in this country believes it. I mean, if we are a center-right country and most of those people in that party believe something to be true, we can't ignore it. We can speak up and say, contrary to fact, contra reality, despite evidence otherwise, we, we, we can't ignore that belief. In the same way we can't it is it is a driving factor in what how these people vote, how they behave, how they see the world. We can't ignore a majority um, worldview. We we can, and we do, as we should at every opportunity, say this is grounded nowhere in reality. This has no basis of fact. This has never been proven. This is working in fantasy land over Disney World. But this is a belief system that pervades most corners of one of the two major parties in this country. And it, it, is, a, it is a competition between a popular former president who has spent years nursing grievances and encouraging trolling versus a news media that if you look at, you know, Pew polling of confidence in public institutions, we've been on the downslide for a very long time. And it's not social media's fault, but social media has expedited this a distrust in who we are, what we say, how we do our jobs. And 
there are admittedly bad actors in our space and they make it so much easier for the public to distrust what the good apples have to say to mix metaphors there. And it it gives distrustful individuals permission to distrust everything. I mean, I was, I, every time I talked to my grandmother who turned 88 last week up in the Youngstown area, there, there's always a, well, if the news is to be believed. <laughs> I mean, this, yeah, this, I know, is, this, I this is an edu- you know, know. A know. multiple college degreed, educated woman who's a former uh, junior high teacher who like, used to have the newspapers sent to her class to do a news literacy course to, for junior high students to understand what they were, what was hitting their doorsteps as a newspaper um, back when newspapers were vibrant institutions. Um, e- even she is saying, well, if, if you can believe what you read in the paper. So, I mean, you, 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 you're running up against this at all levels and then digital natives that who are students in your classrooms, you know, what are, what are they coming up with? And then you throw in there the self-selecting, you know, Facebook, Twitter. I'm not on TikTok because I don't understand it, but TikTok and Snapchat, and you know, just all of these platforms where you can plant a seed of distruth and wind up with a forest of lies. You, you just, I don't know how you, we, with, you know, our pruning scissors, fix that. All I can do is do what I, make sure that what I'm publishing is accurate and do my best to promote it within limits of, you know, shame on social media and try to get what I believe to be true, what I know to be factual um, out there. One last topic, and then I'm going to let you go this time. I'll bring you back again. Um, and it, it's Liz Cheney, but it's more than Liz Cheney. If if I were a Republican who was not a Trumpite, I might say that the only way to stop this person is to launch a viable third party for conservative Republicans who are not Trump base. That would split the vote and perhaps, uh, you know, be the demise of, of the, the, the Trump control. Liz Cheney hasn't talked about that directly, but you know, she is, out there and other people around her are talking about that. She's not somebody to be messed with and she's been messed with. Where does this all go? I have a lot of respect for Liz Cheney um, and how she has comported herself since the January 6th riots. There are a lot of my hyper liberal friends who similarly have a lot of respect for Liz Cheney, who were also in the streets protesting her father is Darth Vader and Satan incarnate during the Bush years. Correct. That it has created a weird um, popularity for Congress, uh, for, for Congresswoman Cheney, uh, although she prefers congressmen. Um, there is a temptation to see Liz Cheney as the leader of a breakaway breakaway party. Liz Cheney herself has said she will not lead that breakaway party. She believes the Republican Party is worth saving from the inside and can be saved with enough um, with enough attention and enough time to get us past Donald Trump. As for a third party in this country, structurally it is almost impossible. I mean, Ross Pro in 1992 kind of proved that. There's a theory that you could do this at the state level, that in some states you could pick off, a, you could split the Republican Party in some states and end its dominance there. Evan McMullen tried that as a third party candidate, as a you know very popular 
uh, Mormon leader in the state of Utah and still couldn't prevail there. Um, um, there's just a, the system is built for two parties. We are not a parliamentary parliamentary system. Um, we're not a coalitional, um, we, we, we don't build coalitions in this country. Right. It is, you, you have a binary choice and it's team red Jersey or blue Jersey. And I think Liz Cheney understands this as, you know, a daughter of a, you know, former, you know, what, what title does Dick Cheney in Washington not have? Right. Um, but she grew up at Dick Cheney's shoulder elbow and has seen how these things go. She also understands that there's a series of expansions and contractions in the Republican party that there was a lurching to the right with Goldwater there was a big tentery um, with 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 Ford. There was a Reagan reaction to that. I mean, you you went, you went from Reagan to Bush, and then Cheney came in as the second Bush's vice president to shore up his conservative um, credentials. I mean, we we've we've seen this party face everything from, you know, far right Rick Santorum to, you know, Wall Street favored Mitt Romney to Donald Trump, whose ideology to this day, I do not understand other than just being mean and winning. Um, There is a, the Republican Party is one of constant um, reinvention. I mean, for your for your listeners, Rick Perlstein's um, series on the Republican Party and its reinventions is just absolutely genius historical writing. Uh, his most recent book, Reaganland, I would commend to anyone trying to understand the historical antecedents of where we are and where we might be going with Republicans. That I mean, Ronald Reagan stayed on the sidelines in '76, hoping to tank the Republican Party so he could come back in 1980. Um, that there is a playbook among Republicans. I mean, history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly quotes itself. It rhymes. I just to borrow. It's not my idea. It's thousands of historiographers um, have written on this, but there is a odd poetry of what Liz Cheney is trying to do here with what um, Reagan was trying to do in um, ap- during after in the 76 to 80 era trying to reinvent the Republican Party reassert herself in the Republican Party as a leader and practice um, to to borrow a, a a bad joke um practice her told you so dance <laughs> that hey i warned you about this he didn't listen to me this happened exactly as i predicted how you like me now and that's that's where liz cheney is posturing herself but she does have a difficult path ahead she is facing a primary in her home state um I don't know that she survives it, but I also know never to bet against a Cheney in Washington that, you know, she will be able to credibly tap into the Bush alumni network. And I'm just going to say like, there, there's no reason to believe that this is going to happen just yet. But if George W. Bush sets foot in the state, there is equal chance that he winds up having the largest political rally in history in that state. And there's an equal chance that he is booed off the stage. (laughs) Oh, wow. No, I mean, I saw it, I saw it in South Carolina when in, in primary, when Jeb Bush had W come off the sidelines in um, Charleston for the first public campaign event of him. And the next night, four times as many people showed up in the exact same room for Donald Trump. Well, on that note, 
we're going to wrap it up for this time, Phil. As always, thank you so much. You know, let let's give a plug for your newsletter. Uh, yes. Tell people tell people what it is, how they re- reach it, how how they get it sent to them. Uh, you know, it always prompts me to think, and so it's it's really a really really good piece. Thanks for that, my friend. Um, so. For those of you who are unfamiliar, I write a now three times a week newsletter uh, for Time Magazine. It's called the DC Brief, and it takes a step back from the headlines and looks at what is happening here and why it matters outside of the Beltway. It decodes Washington, kind of translates what you're seeing in the headlines, and explains with you know my 20 years here in Washington um, what actually has happened and why it's happening, why these people are doing this. You can sign up for it at time.com slash DC brief. Um, it is free. Uh, it hits your inboxes um, in the afternoon. So it's perfect for when you're having your second cup of coffee and taking a break from work and not yeah. quite done with your day, but you're kind of done with the day. I, I hit that afternoon lull and read your copy. <laughs> well, it's it's great. It's it's terrible fun um, to write. It's it's a it's a reported newsletter, so it's borderline opinion column slash analysis slash a lot of a lot of my smart friends' um, intelligence makes its way in there blindly. Um, it, it's we're trying to just make sense of what happens in Washington that. Everything happening here is so much noise, so much fury, but I think there's a way for us to explain it in a way that just strips away all the artifice and tells you, this is what's happening. Here's why. It's, and it's, one of the things I like about it, it's it's documented. It either uh, refers you to other articles or other research, uh, it, so it's, it, it's full of links every single time that if you really want to go deeper into something, you can do that. And that's nice to have that all in one place. Yeah. And I'm, I'm enjoying it because it's, it's, it, I get to bring the receipts that it's, I, I can make the, I can assert something, but then I can prove it right there. It's, it's basically a, a, a daily thesis of, you know, this is, this is my argument about why this is happening in Washington. Um, and here's, and if you don't, if you disagree with me, you can write me at politicsatime.com and, you know, prove me wrong and I'll be happy to write up your, uh, your argument. As always, Phil, thank you. We'll be back in touch. Thanks, Tom. Today, we've been talking with Time Washington correspondent Phil Elliott about the control Donald Trump still has on the Republican Party. Spectrum is produced by WOUB Public Media. Adam Rich is our co-producer. I'm your host, Tom Hudson. Please subscribe to Spectrum. You can do that at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or at NPR One. And Spectrum also is available through the NPR Podcast Directory. We always welcome your feedback, so please rate our podcast or review it through one of your favorite podcast outlets. If you have any questions or comments about our podcast or have suggested topics for us to cover in the future, please direct them to me by email. You can do that at hodson at ohio.edu. That's hodson, H-O-D-S-O-N, at ohio.edu. Dot edu.